Welcome to Behind the Schemes, a discussion of how commerce, corruption, and counterfeit cures are destroying our planet's precious wildlife. This is Risha Kota Larsen with the Behind the Schemes, and in this episode, we're talking about rhino horn and organized crime. South Africa's rhino crisis has made headlines around the world and seems to be everywhere in social media, but for some reason, the rhino death toll is still on the rise. Recently, I had the opportunity to speak with investigative journalist Julian Rademeyer about his work inside the rhino crisis. You could write about anything that you want. What made you decide to focus on South Africa's rhino crisis? I think in many ways I, I, I stumbled into it by chance. Um, at the time I was working for Media 24 Investigations, which was essentially an investigative unit within one of South Africa's largest newspaper groups. Um, and I was writing, much of the writing I was doing was focused fairly heavily on, on organized crime, on corruption, on that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and I heard about a case um, of a South African farmer, as it was initially reported, who'd been arrested in Zimbabwe. Now, as a bit of context, it was around the time that uh, Robert Mugabe, the Zimbabwean president, was involved in a number of land grabs, farmland was being taken away. Um, there was there, there were a number of stories about uh, um, Zimbabwean farmers being attacked by so-called war veterans and so on. So I started looking at this um, and discovered that he had actually not been arrested, and uh, as we suspected, um, for for spurious reasons, but it had been connected to a rhino poaching incident. Hmm. Uh, and I subsequently started investigating that particular case, and it led me on a quite an interesting journey up to Zimbabwe. Where, um, uh, we managed to get hold of cell phone records. We tracked down a firearm that was used in one of these particular incidents. Um, traced the serial numbers back to an attack on a farm in South Africa where an elderly couple were quite severely assaulted, um, and a number of weapons were stolen. Text messages sent from from his phone showed that he was clearly in contact with a number of poachers. Um, uh, two of whom were shot. One was killed. The other one was wounded during a poaching incident, um, which is when um, you know the initial indications were that that he was involved. And essentially, he was he he had a criminal record going back to the mid eighties. Um, mm. Victim to poaching, um, he clearly was quite active. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he wasn't a big player, but he was definitely trying to set up his own, or appeared to be trying to set up his own um, own organization and syndicate. And that from there it it, it grew. Um, you know, around the same time, I heard about Davy Grunewald, um, the South African farmer who mm-hmm. has been arrested, probably one of the most high-profile arrests here, um, linked to um, illegal hunting of rhinos. Um, and uh, most recently, um, there was an asset forfeiture order granted against him, where his assets, including a farm and various other properties, helicopters and so on, were frozen. Um, I think valued about. 50 million rands, you look at roughly, what, $4 million million thereabouts, um, which um, he will stand to lose if he is convicted. Mm, Wow. Yep. And what what two stories all this time have surprised or shocked you the most? Is there maybe one good one and, and one bad one? Um, I, for me, it's actually quite it's quite difficult to say. Mm. You know, if there are stories that have shocked me most. I mean, it's I've been working on this now for pretty much close on two years, um, mm-hmm. and you know, it comes it kind of comes in waves. You've mm-hmm. got you know, each each story you hear, you kind of go, "Wow!" But you know, I didn't think that was possible. Um, you know, you hear a story about. Um, a rhino calf being killed by poachers because it's harrying them while they're trying to take off its mother's <laughs> horns, yeah. you know. Um, and you, you kind of hear these increasingly sort of inhumane stories. Um, mm-hmm. You hear captive rhinos being kept and their, their horns being cut off um, so deeply that it actually hacks into the flesh, mm-hmm. um, the horns won't regrow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's, it's very hard for me to say, you know, if there's, if there's a worse one. I mean, I, yeah. most of them are Calling. Um, yeah. What I have found is that, um, you know, I mean, another example, I mean, pseudo hunts, which has become a big thing. Um, these yes. hunts are actually staged as a way of getting horn legally, in inverted commas, out of the country to, to Vietnam. 
Um, you know, you've got pseudo hunts that go terribly wrong because you're dealing with supposed hunters who are actually not hunters who don't know how to fire a weapon, and they, you know, essentially end up shooting a rhino, you know, a dozen times or six times or whatever. Ugh, right. Uh, so it just gets worse and worse. Um, what I have found, which you know, on a more upbeat, positive <laughs> side, uh, it's. Um, I mean, I, South Africa at the moment is going through a bit of a crisis of confidence in the police and investigations. We've got um, uh, a police force that is in serious trouble, that's riddled with corruption, um, inefficiency. It's, it's been a, a steady sort of process downwards um, over the last couple of years. We've got a former police chief, uh, national police chief, who's sitting in jail, um, convicted of fraud and corruption. Um, our current police chief is under suspicion of fraud and corruption or, 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 or suspicion of corruption involving tender processes. Um, we've got our crime intelligence division, which has been crippled by political infighting within the ruling party and, again, allegations of corruption there. The head of that unit has been accused of murder. So Ugh. just a bit of background. I mean, it's, we, we well. have a serious problem with our police force here. Um, <laughs> But what I have found quite encouraging is that the people dealing with wildlife crime, the people who are working at South Africa's national parks, the people in the Hawks, which is probably the closest that South Africa has to an FBI equivalent, mm -hmm. um, are incredibly committed. You know, there's there's a very small team of people. Um, you know, you're not talking about hundreds of, of cops or agents who can fan out, much like Fish and Wildlife did a while ago. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about incredibly small teams, you know, um, probably, you know, a handful by comparison. But they are incredibly dedicated and they are starting to make inroads. So we, we're seeing that with some of the arrests that are being done um, most recently this week with uh, the Vietnamese and it was caught with 10 rhino horns, um, some ivory and a, and a substantial amount of cash. Mm, yeah. Uh, the South African Revenue Service, which has also started looking at, at wildlife crimes as part of their illicit economy investigation. And they, they make Great strides. So that's been very encouraging. Oh, that is. And the South African Revenue Service, that's basically the equivalent of our Internal Revenue Service. Yeah. Okay. The, the tax guys, yeah, the mm -hmm. tax man. Yeah. Hmm. What's been the biggest challenge, you think, to you uh, writing about this topic? Um, I think, you know, people have surprisingly been quite open. I mean, I've managed to interview people I never thought that I would be able to interview. But mm -hmm. uh, the biggest frustration, I think, has probably been government, dealing with government. Oh, um, yeah. you know, running into a wall of red tape, dealing mm -hmm. with government spokespeople. And in many ways, I've found that as the crisis has worsened, and, you know, despite the good work being done by the people I've mentioned, um, there's almost been a kind of a knee-jerk thing on the part of, of government officials, government spin doctors, to um, to run for the hills, you know, to, to try and give out as little information as possible, um, to limit access as much as possible, um, and to frustrate efforts to try and get you know, simple questions answered. You know, they're quite happy to put out a press release, um, but they don't like it if you ask questions beyond their press release. Um, and you eventually you find yourself with um, questions being ignored or, you know, uh, fob off or interviews that you request happening, if all, runs down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, oh, yeah, I've um, kind of noticed that as I read some of the information that's coming out. Oh, yeah, I think... Uh, I think I've observed that as well. I can't even imagine I mean, what it would be like to actually be trying to, to dig around there yourself. A nice, a nice example is, you know, they'll, they'll release, um, regularly release poaching figures. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, it's very difficult to, to independently verify those figures, but they'll also release, for instance, the number of arrests. Um, I think currently it's staying at about 120 arrests countrywide. Whew. What they won't release is convictions. Um, and it's very difficult to get a picture of how many people are being convicted. I mean, if you look at South Africa, I mean, the the number of cases going to court of mm -hmm. cases being investigated is fairly low. Um, our conviction rate of the cases that actually make it to court is, stands at around, around about 30%. So, you know, you're wondering how many of these guys that have been arrested. It looks great. You know, we've caught 120 mm -hmm. plus mm -hmm. the poach. 
but how many of them are actually doing jail time? Yeah, the conviction rate would be really helpful. I think everyone would love to see uh, to see that and also to see which ones are being sent to jail. Hmm, exactly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hmm. And this, I guess, kind of goes back to the first question. Do you see the rhino crisis as more of a conservation issue, or do you think this is really more of an organized crime issue? I think I think it's a combination of the two. I mean, mm-hmm. I think it's it's you know it it is it is both. Um, it's you know. It's it's the it it does come down to conservation practices. It comes down to I mean it it it's a fairly comprehensive sort of issue. So mm-hmm. you look at the way field rangers operate. You're looking at um, private rhino owners. You're looking at at that side of things, and then you are looking at the you know organised crime. Um, and as far as organised crime goes, um, you know we we having impacts. Um, on various levels, um, the the investigators here like to break it down on almost a five tier level. Um, you know, level five being the syndicate kingpin. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, levels one, two, three, and four being various people starting at the bottom of the poacher. Then you've got the the runners, the middlemen, um, the local dealers, etc. Mm-hmm. And they've quite a lot of impact on levels one through three, um, and some in level four, but virtually nothing in level five, which is where the problem lies. Um, right, I agree. <laughs> you know, my, my experience, I mean, I traveled to Vietnam and Laos and so on to, to look at this, and, you know, I followed up on um, one particular syndicate boss that I'd been interested in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, that's surprising. I mean, I discovered that he was very well protected. Um, hmm. He's very connected politically. Um, hmm. You know, he's essentially untouchable. There's no one's going to oh get to Oh, my him. gosh. Um, and you know, then again, from from that, if you go back down to level one to the poacher, you mm-hmm. know, um, you looking you've got to, you've got to kind of look at the the drivers. I mean, if you go to a place like Mozambique and you mm-hmm. look at the incredible poverty and the sort of rather bleak situation on the border between South Africa and, and Mozambique, um, it's not surprising that you've got poachers queuing up to to come through and try and get a run with the kind of money being offered. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got people who have to come to South Africa to find work um, mm-hmm. because they're work in those areas. And, and to do that, many of them don't have passports. They cross through the Kruger National Park. Um, and, you know, it's a hell of a lot easier to um, try and go and get a rhino um, and you know, make whatever you know, anything between eight thousand and forty thousand rand, mm-hmm. uh, in, and take you know instead of taking the same risks and crossing the park to Johannesburg, we can earn three thousand rand if you're lucky as a builder or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. That's that's another you know another aspect. So, uh, and someone I spoke to recently said you've got to tackle it on all levels um, because if you slip on one of them, um, it will become fairly overwhelming fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Hmm. What do you think, um, because this is, this crisis has been, I think, reported on all over the world um, at this point. What do you think that the media has done right in covering the situation? And where do you think things could be improved? I think with the media, it's always it's always the problem of um, looking at the the kind of depths of coverage. I mean, there's mm-hmm. been a lot of relatively shallow coverage. Yeah. Um, there's there's been some really good work done as well, but it's 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 kind of individual cases. You know, you have individual journalists or individual mm-hmm. television channels who will put the time and the resources resources into doing the story. I mean, I saw recently there was quite a nice package done by um, Agence France Presse, uh, a sort of five part series on the Rhino trade, which they syndicate to all their uh, you know across the world um, through the agency. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's been some very good television stuff, but I've I've seen a, a lot of really good work that's being done on on blogs, you know, and in social media circles, um, which I and I think you've got people on a social media level who kind of have the passion and the vested interest, which mm-hmm. push it to a different level, you know. Um, I mean, your website's one one example of those that, that kind of sort of coverage. Um, 
and it it does give it a lot more depth. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of international coverage, and by nature, I mean if you're trying to to um, sell a story to to viewers who don't have that direct sort of connection to it. Right. Uh, is is kind of a parachute approach. You know, you drop in, you do the interviews, um, and uh, you get the, the the basics. But it doesn't take it much beyond that. Um, whereas in you know in, in blogs and in magazines, some magazines and and quite a lot of the sort of some of the local stuff that's being done, I I, I see more depth to to the kind of coverage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed um, with blogging that's where a lot of stories uh, start now. And I think that a lot of um, other journalists will go to blogs to um, get little seeds for stories. And then finally it bubbles up to mm. the mainstream media coverage. Mm. And Facebook, Twitter is the other example. Mm, I mean, a lot yeah. of you know, the breaking news stuff on rhino arrests and so on is happening on uh, you know you get it off Twitter before you get it off um, off a news website and a lot of the debate um, particularly in South Africa I mean there's a lot of debate going on on Facebook a um, lot of various different um, organizations you know even the the pro sort of trade lobby are now you know getting into social media in a big way um, so a lot of this is actually a lot of the debate is taking place online Hmm, mm hmm. And do you think that's helpful? Social media has that kind of changed the way that, as a journalist, where you get information and how you distribute it, that sort of thing. You said that because um, I know you, I know that you use Twitter a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> but um, no. I mean, it 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 is a very it is a very useful tool. It's a mm -hmm. great way of contact with people. Mm -hmm. um, the the drawback in in a South African situation, pretty much in a sort of an African situation, is that usage is quite limited. You know, your your average person in South Africa doesn't have internet access. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of um, it's 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 not as readily available as it should be. Um, so it limits you in that in that sense. And you do often find yourself, you know, in a situation where you've got pretty much the same voices, but um, I think with with kind of reaching out and with kind of keeping tabs of the sort of work being done, um, you know, both locally and internationally, it's an incredible tool. You know, it's a great way of just catching up and keeping tabs on on a really fast developing story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Do you like any other social media tools besides Twitter? Uh, to be honest, I'm not the world's greatest sort of social media. I, I, uh, I've recently tried sort of tried getting into um, Facebook again. Uh, mm -hmm. I've never quite understood it. Uh, Twitter, yeah, for me as a as a journalist, I think you'll find many many journalists find mm -hmm. it uh, very useful because it's it's kind of it, it's a bit like having a, a, a wire agency on your phone. You know, it's. The, the breaking news stories you can follow newspapers that you're interested in um, and you've got these sort of live updates almost of what's what's going on um, and that that for me has been really interesting I mean we've got a lot of my colleagues use it um, you know they'll report cases live from from courtrooms it's a great way to reach people who are interested in what you're interested in in some ways um, and to keep tabs on on, on an issue mm -hmm. but on that, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm fairly limited in, in terms of what I use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like using Twitter for those reasons as well. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as speaking of your work and what you do, when and where are we going to be able to see more of your work? Well, at at the moment, I'm busy. I've I've been working full time for the last couple of months. I'm mm -hmm. trying to pull together a book on this particular subject. Um, wow. and it's it's best to get a book looking at various aspects, following up on specific stories. Um, and at this stage, it's it's due for publication around about November. Um, so yeah, hopefully it'll be out out by then. It should be available both locally and internationally. It should also be available through Amazon by then. Oh, that's so exciting. I cannot wait to read your book. I'm really excited to see it. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Just the right that has to be done. <laughs> well, Julian, it was fantastic to finally chat with you after all this time. Um, it, we've been communicating on Twitter, and it's been great to finally speak with you. 
No, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. You've been listening to Rhino Horn and Organized Crime with Julian Rodemeyer, investigative journalist. This is Risha Kota Larsen with Behind the Schemes.